Thank you. So thank you. It's rich, absorbing, uh, and sobering. You know, normally when we have uh, Myanmar forums here, we will talk about geopolitics. Uh, Jinzo Abe has just uh, visited Myanmar, and uh, President Teng Seng has just visited Washington, and what are the implications and consequences. But you've given us a very sobering, on the ground. Um, perspective of uh, meeting and handling the challenges of development uh, from a technocratic point of view, uh, if I may say so. Now the floor is opened uh, for comments and questions. Uh, I also, okay, I see a couple of hands up. Let me ask, I know that Ong Zhao, would you like to add anything? Uh, anything you want to say at this time? If not, it's okay. I, I agree with the about holistic approach, but like, but um, this violence seems to me that uh, it has been instigated by the, uh, some elements uh, within the uh, establishment. So, if we could elaborate more on that, it would be very interesting because of Guzhou seems to be kind of insider in the uh, insider in the uh, establishment. So, I I strongly suspect that. Uh, this violence is not not just happened out of the blue. It has been systematically, politically motivated by some elements prior to the 2015 general election. So I would say that the election campaign just started now. Thank you. So I was interested in your discussion of uh, this EITI um, and a big topic at the moment is this 800 kilometer long pipelines that are supposedly going to start operation in July or something. Uh, given the concerns that everyone has about this pipeline, the lack of returns for Myanmar, uh, uh, what land purchases inadequate, what what not, do you really do you expect a review of these deals before they uh, uh, become operational, both the uh, natural gas and the oil pipeline? It, when you look at it from the EITI perspective, um, the natural gas, the pipelines projects are the one that generates the very high percentage of revenue right now. So we are very much on it. Um, if I may um, share some information about what the government is trying to do. Of course, uh, one similar project that we had in the past um, is about the Miso Dam. So the government, the president was able to make a kind of administrative uh, order to stop the project. But there were a lot of issues about international contractual obligations that we had. So this is also very thorny issues because on one hand, we really wanted to address some of these uh, uh, challenging aspects of some mega projects. But on the other hand, we had our commitment to the international business community where we can't really uh, go back and change a lot of these contractual obligations. Um, so I think on that balance, I think we got the mechanism like EITI. So from looking forward, we will try to use a lot of these international standards to make the new projects as uh, sustainable as uh, community friendly as uh, uh, producing a lot of uh, benefits for the population, not just bringing the revenues. So I think in that in that uh, <coughs> priority, uh, we are now trying to uh, finalize many environmental laws and standards, and uh, like e environmental impact uh, assessment, uh, social impact assessments. And they're also trying to trying to strengthen these regimes, not just a uh, kind of a, 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 a business as usual analysis. Try to make uh, the project happens, but we try to make that these processes vigorous. So I think it will be uh, <coughs> lawfully required uh, step for any future investment to do the EIA and the SIA. And then because this is. Uh, we are not talking about the actual operations of these pipelines and a lot of uh, resource extractions. We are talking about 
the environmental standards. So we should be able to enforce these standards in the future. So trying to move most of our stakeholders through the new process, we should be able to mitigate a lot of uh, negative and side effects from these uh, big investment projects. And then in, in the meantime, we are all, the, the many of these uh, natural resource uh, agencies, what they are trying to do is trying to strengthen their legal and financial capacity to understand the complex uh, contractual requirements and at the same time project financing a lot of cost benefit analysis. We were many in many t of these previous uh, instances we are rather uh, duped by a lot of uh, these com complicated uh, contractual and financial models. So now the ministries are required to immediately strengthen these resources and I think this is one of our uh, requests, priority requests to many of uh, international financial institutions and donor agencies to help us. So with all these uh, standards, we should be able to make these uh, earlier commitments less uh, socially and environmentally damaging and to get more benefits out of these projects. So I think this is, I think, a priority that we should move in and try to secure uh, our firm control on through these new standards. Then perhaps once we get uh, real cooperation between the government, people, civil society, and many of these uh, international businesses, we should be able to start tackling some of those excesses of the past. Um, thank you. So I think uh, Gwen Robinson has a little bit to add. Yeah, uh, just um, one point uh, that would be interesting to um, clarify. In my, uh, I visited the pipeline facility of uh, Rakhine um, and interviewed people there, including Chinese officials. But also in my talks with some of the stakeholders and people you refer to, Zoro, it seems to me that there's two distinct issues. One is the prospect of, uh, say, a kind of Mietzone style, either cancellation or a complete rethink of existing plans. But the other thing I, I got the impression also from interviews with people like Uso Thane, who are kind of dealing with the big picture of all this, that uh, there might be a push on to actually renegotiate the financial terms of existing contracts, for example, the uh, Thai gas pipeline and, uh, and the Chinese gas pipeline. Is that your kind of understanding? I just have uh, small questions. Uh, of course, as I say, if you look at the f from the perspective of flashback, uh, this is a kind of process. But uh, we would like to know what are really the major factors that brings General Tenzin and the government Mark came to the point that it is time to reform. And there is no, from my understanding from the speakers, mentioning about how ASEAN's play a constructive role in this by using what we call ASEAN way, constructive engagement. Does it really play a role, I mean, uh, a kind of uh, impact on this uh, process? Uh, because, you know, in the past ASEAN, in this case also Indonesia, has been strongly criticized. Why you entertain Myanmar, for instance? Uh, this is something, but we, ASEAN has a commitment and insists that it is the way by pursuing what we call constructive engagement. It did work. This is, I think, something we need to bring up as a kind of flashback. So, because we are talking about the current situation, of course, this is a good, everybody's happy about that. And there's a, still challenges ahead, and we want to make sure that, that everybody support the process in Myanmar now. Thank you very much. I, I think everyone should take credit for that. I, I think it's a combination of uh, both pressure and uh, uh, constructive engagement, I think it all work. I think either quiet diplomacy or sanctions or pressure, I think it all work. We reached to this point. Uh, but as I think agree with the ambassador that it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a, it's a very f fragile process. So we shouldn't give up. We got to keep pushing. How much we have energy to put everyone, the stakeholders, in, in the straight jackets. I mean, that, that's very important. I, I'm still very cautious. Because the reform itself is still a very much uh, army, ini army initiative. Uh, it's top down. 
I think uh, Guzo will talk about you know, low-hanging fruits. Uh, I think we, we haven't talked about corruption, all these big issues in China investment and the U.S. strategic uh, re-engagement with, with, with Asia and Burma. So I think th these are the bigger issues that uh, we still kind of give you, uh, provide you a very sufficient answer to that. And particularly with the research, I think China is so important. And they say it seems to be savior of our ISO projects. It's a suspension. And there is, there is a now people saying that he wants to, or Chinese wants to restart it, the projects. But what about the uh, hydropower dam projects in Sanlin and other areas? All the bigger, mega, mega projects are in ethnic regions. And the ethnic voices are very important to listen. I, I don't see any ethnic, ethnic the people who are speaking on this issue in, in this forum. I think that's why, in the, in the, in the future, I think it's important to invite uh, these ethnic leaders to come and speak for, for themselves. Yeah, I also agree with uh, Angzo. I think, given the fact that we are getting a lot of help on this transition, I think we must appreciate all every everyone's contribution to it. Um, on, on the ASEAN uh, and constructive engagement, I I may be a bit stretching and speculating a bit, but I think uh, what ASEAN did give a nice uh, example is the, the the one that you have um, Indonesia play a very important role. It's um, when we had the uh, cyclone disaster, the cyclone Nagis. It was ASEAN, of course, the Surin. Uh, Jiang Surin um, should be also commended for that. It's a <clears throat> try to help with this, uh, what we call the tripartite core group. At the time, the, the previous leaders were quite allergic to international assistance, and so they were, you know, Seventh Fleet trying to supply a whole lot of uh, uh, assistance, but uh, somehow the ASEAN has to intervene and help. And the DCG actually worked quite, quite well. And that was the incident i believe i now know uh in the hindsight and I'm talking from a lot of people president uteng singh was in charge of this uh, recovery uh, committee and then he was uh dealing with a lot of these challenges and then i think he saw how vulnerable it is and he came from the iraudi delta one of the village from the iraudi delta so he he it was very very uh moved a lot of people confirmed that uh, he many of uh, ideas uh, he actually got it from his experience in dealing with the uh, post-disaster reconstruction and um, um, so I think that's uh, maybe uh, uh, one incident how the ASEAN has uh, played a role. Just on the um, question from Ambassador Lutfi, um, I think it's a very important question particularly domestically too because it goes to the the, uh, the question of the ownership of the resort of the reform process and who actually has a stake in making it work. So it's an absolutely critical issue. Um, a, a couple of comments. I, I I don't think I heard a reference to the census, and my understanding is that uh, there hasn't been a census in Myanmar since 1983, and that there are plans for a census in 2014. So next year, presumably prior to the elections, but that's uh, clearly a very important tool around uh, information gathering and there's huge gaps there at the moment. Um, how important a tool it ends up will depend, among other things, on the confidence of people to actually answer the questions. Um, and you know, a lot of census work is face to face, so how that structure is going to be vitally important, uh, it, would, it would seem to me, and there's potentially some very sensitive areas to come out. You know, what are the size of the ethnic minorities? What is the spread of the population and the like? So, um, I, I, you know, that may be something you might want to talk about. Um, a quick response or a co comment on uh, Gwen's comment about ODA and the pro approaches of donors and governments and would absolutely agree someone I know who's been in country for a long time and is well respected had said that one of the key things that the Myanmar government needs to do is to learn how to say no and um, I think that's a, a valid point there's a rush of corporates but also institutions and donors and the risk is of, uh, of um, 
getting away from best practice in terms of ODA so that um, uh, it's supply driven rather than demand driven and in the absence of good data you know clearly there can be huge risks and in, in heading off in particular directions without knowing the consequences. I, I suppose just one other question or comment I think there'll be quite a bit of interest in perspectives from the panel on the Rohingya situation and particularly from within the country we we have a an external perspective and there's a lot of attention there but you know I, I, I think a number of people have been following you know what is the NLD saying what's Aung San Suu Kyi saying about this what are, what's the social media debate what are the issues and, and I think some of some of the social commentary particularly has been you know quite quite concerning and worrying to those outside the country but what is the perspective of those within within the country and the views of what's happening there and how that's perceived so um, thank you very much but on the Rohingya this comes back also to your point Aung Zhao, uh, and Zhao Wu, uh, uh, is it really uh, not that I mean it seems to us that it's spontaneous uh, much of this sectarian violence uh, do you think that it's been uh, orchestrated uh, what are the, some of the views on the ground, uh, as far as you can ascertain? Uh, uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, she said something uh, recently that uh, this uh, measure to uh, limit uh, offspring of Muslim, fa Muslim families uh, is, uh, is inhumane. Uh, and, and that was, I think, maybe the first major, uh, could it be the first major criticism uh, or comment uh, so, what are some of the views on the ground? Is that this racial uh, undertones that we see? Is it really just kind of manufactured? <laughs> to what extent do you think it's really instigated? Uh, I, I really think that I was instigated. Uh, I was in Burma last year in. In June, when when the violence started in uh, Flip in uh, Arakan State, and uh, it, w it was very obvious that uh, the, the the elements uh, I don't want to name names because of as a journalist uh, I'm I'm doing my homework. So and but I've been writing a lot in the New York Times and also in the you know, in other newspaper that uh, the element elements are within the establishment. Are some are linked to the government, uh, some are linked to the uh, ruling party, are behind, and uh, even uh, you know it's difficult for me to speak in this forum because of uh, even uh, an army officer who worked for the president, uh, Teng Sai, who was very active in a Facebook, uh, w was one of the main instigators to to release. A, He's a speechwriter. He is known to be a reformist, but uh, uh, he he was the one. I think Gozo knows what I'm who I'm talking about. Uh, was, uh, that, uh, all these evidence suggests that that uh, are these violence uh, against the Rohingya or Muslims are uh, systematically targeted by. It happened right after the election, by election, after Aung San Suu Kyi party and the NLD won the uh, landslide victory in elections. And then it has been always been organized by the state, uh, sponsored by the state in the past last 30, 40 years. And whenever uh, they want to provoke uh, public anger, because the deep seated uh, uh, sentiment or feeling or anti-Muslim. It's very easy to provoke that kind of feeling. And why not against China? You know, like uh, this happened in, in Lashu. I was there Lashu when last year. I want to check out what Chinese are doing there, right? So Chinese migration is an investment there. And, uh, and I, I, I would be, I would be, it's quite logical to see that if, if Burmese is going after, or Shans are going after Chinese in Lashu. But why, to yesterday, why the, the Muslim, the very smallest, the very small groups in, in Lashu, and why the local groups are going after, going after the, uh, the 
yeah, Muslim is 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 I think is is instigated, and also the w one f very frightening is that uh, the social media group belong to hardliner or ruling party. They play. I mean, simultaneously, they play. They started to spread the hate speech as soon as the violence started there. So I think there are two or three groups work together to 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 you know to set up this this kind of uh, anti-Muslim uh, campaign. I think it is ahead of the uh, 2015 elections, and Aung San Suu Kyi made a fatal mistake because she was quiet and she people in Burma think that she chose a wrong topic to speak out now because of this two child policies so you can see more negative and negative comments in the social media these against Aung San Suu Kyi so it's a very clever strategy to 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 say that because I'm Burmese I can read both I mean in, in Burmese language and English language that suggested that if NLD Aung San Suu Kyi wins in 2015, Burma will become an Islamic nation. They have written in, 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 they propagate this in, 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 in a social media, it's so active and, and a lot of hate speech being spread in, 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 a, in the social media. It is by anonymous, of course, you can you can register in a Facebook. I think there are a big team working behind it to launch this campaign. It's very sophisticated, I would say. Our situation actually presents a lot of opportunities for those who want to instigate by using many of these um, deep-seated uh, fault lines to really gain benefits out of it. I think that's quite possible. Um, but um, to, 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 to put squarely on one institution or one leader uh, as the, the main instigator, I think it is a little bit, uh, uh, it, we may have to look you know, quite, quite carefully and a lot of many factors are involved. Uh, for example, like uh, one of the evidences that a lot of people are using about the military, no, I'm sorry, that the police uh, being uh, uh, <clears throat> friendlier to some of these perpetrators. So there was a video clip, I think, famously uh, taken by the BBC, and it has been airing a lot. And that was a uh, evidence used by um, the the many international human rights organizations to pinpoint. So there's a government hand on it. Unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> we we have to really uh, go deeper than that, deeper than the one picture, one video footage, and try to s explain everything. Uh, I, I had a chance to talk to some of these people. And, and what happened before that Metila uh, incident was the one in the copper mine crisis, where the, lo the police was uh, <clears throat> instructed by the chief minister to suppress the uh, copper miners, which is very much linked to the more democracy activists and ADA generations and then also the much more sympathetic elements to the to Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, unfortunately, the police um, uh, did a very heavy hand and then uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, injury uh, incurred to the Buddhist monks. So the not just the, the police and the chief minister, but the entire uh, government was forced to apologize in Mandalay. That was uh, huge. Uh, and then many the police officers are being reprimanded. And then uh, the chief minister was uh, very, very uh, 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 cautioned by the president. Then the next, then following that, that the Maitila incident happened. And then another chief minister from the neighboring uh, state, uh, the, the copper mine is in Zagain division and Zagain chief minister and then his the police are involved, and then the Metila is in the Manle, the neighboring state. The Man, uh, Manle chief minister and um, the Manle police are involved. And the Manle chief minister, a lot of people agree that he is a bit more uh, uh, <coughs> reasonable and very much sympathetic towards the reform. So he waited 
many hours uh, to take actions. And then his police watch because they don't want to use the, uh, the force. And unfortunately then, that, that was also quite known to many of the European uh, embassies and um, many uh, uh, donor agencies. And then in the, the U.S. trip, the, the president actually, the first thing he asked from the U.S. government is, train our police on the riot control. <laughs> so I think that's, you know, that's a one uh, part of the issues where the role of the police has not been well defined. The police have been always secondary to the military. They never really have to deal with any of these incidents and then all of a sudden they were pushed to the front line because the, the military is not supposed to handle these elements and then they were not well equipped. They were equipped with the domestically made these fire bombs and which really bomb and kill people. I think the same incident happened in um, uh, in, in uh, Bangkok, uh, May incidents. I, uh, I, I remember it because I was here. Uh, <clears throat> so when you shoot the, bo uh, the fire bomb, it's not really come out smoke, it's really kill people. So I think that's how it happened. So I think this is a uh, institution issues. Uh, uh, and then also we are in the, the middle of decentralization. All the chief ministers are being empowered to uh, govern the regions and states, and then they, the the the, the Navy law is not supposed to uh, come and uh, intervene them right quickly. So it is on their hand to handle these issues. So a lot of things, the mishap happen, and uh, but uh, it could be also easily interpreted as uh, uh, the government stage uh, uh, incidences, and then then also the the motive of the military is very difficult to define because uh, you know it, even though there may be a lot of evidences where is the motive um, because one one <coughs> very um, factual and uh, one uh, documented evidence that we can pinpoint what is the motive of the military right now uh, one area that you can actually observe and actually try to tell you, which we are trying to do, is uh, the way that they voted in the parliament. I, you will be very surprised to know that we try to save the foreign investment law from the hands of the nationalist elements in the parliament, which really wants to uh, protect all the, the domestic uh, uh, business interests in the name of uh, the national ownership. It's the military MPs who voted in favor of the more liberal foreign investment law. There was a, a lot of, I think, Gwyn actually is aware of uh, all these uh, the interactions between the executive branch, the president who wants to really favor the 100% ownership for many of these uh, manufacturing and labor intensive industry. And this is where we can actually uh, have the start but it was a pushback from the parliament. Unfortunately, many uh, <coughs> strong personalities within the parliament actually favored many of these uh, nationalist elements. And then, then when it comes to the very crunch time, the president has to convince the, the, the upper house and then the military MPs and military MPs voted in them block to help the president. And then uh, this is the infamous uh, impeachment of the constitutional tribunal. Um, I, if I may, uh, just to explain a little background. There, there was a constitutional tribunal. It was uh, uh, president appointed the, the, the retired judges and uh, uh, legal officials sitting at the constitutional tribunal. They are supposed to handle a lot of uh, constitutional disputes, particularly in the areas of the central and regional power sharing and things of like that. And then also, what is uh, 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 who, who should start in some of these laws between the parliament and the executive branch. So they are there to answer and read and interpret the, the text of the law. But unfortunately, they, they, uh, they got into the wrong move where they try to interpret the text of the law, which is, I think they are doing their job. But unfortunately, that um, insulted many uh, um, uh, parliamentarians. And then there was a huge um, 
uh, mobilization in the, in the parliament to impeach the constitutional process, which uh, many of intellectuals in the country were very much uh, worried and they're very much against it because uh, even though it was appointed by the president and then the former uh, previous government, but nevertheless, it is a kind of an institution that empowers the judiciary branch uh, in, in a very nascent uh, uh, framework and that we should not, I think Thailand will appreciate this, um, we should not really circumspect the, the role of the judges and judiciary people to be able to interpret and to be able to help in uh, some of these situations. Unfortunately, the parliament was so activist and then they got the, the support from the opposition and then they were able to launch it. The military MPs again voted in favor of keeping the tri constitutional tribunal, but unfortunately this time, uh, the president and the executive branch cannot convince it. So the, the, the executive branch lost the motion and then the impeachment happened and the whole the judicial uh, bench uh, was uh, uh, were forced to resign and then now it's a newly appointed uh, by the president three judges were appointed by the president three from the up lower house and three from the upper house but unfortunately since that happened the constitutional code has been very quiet it's very, very very unfortunate so I think there are many other incidences where the military is seems to be following the example of uh, Indonesia I think looks like they are really um, <coughs> looking forward and um, uh, many of these uh, previous privileges and perks goes to the former military leaders not the current one so I think this is another interesting research topics um, so I think now they seems to be quite uh, following the leadership of the president to try to push the reforms and then in many uh, when it comes to the real time they, they try to provide a lot of uh, help so with that evidence it's really hard for me to square uh, the other evidences and then the uh, assertion that the military is very much behind it um, so but of course I can uh, recognize that uh, the opportunities are there. And then also the social media is, uh, we try to, to uh, write to uh, the uh, Facebook and try to uh, be more vigilant about these uh, pages. This is really, really uh, problematic. And then uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Facebook doesn't have the Burmese uh, monitors, so they don't know where, what's going on. So we, we are working on it, and so we hope that the Facebook can start taking actions on that. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a contrast that we'll keep our eye on, uh, you know, whether, to what extent it's an organized violence, and to what extent it's really uh, uh, much more nuance that the not that the established authorities are organizing it but that the established authorities are mishandling it or coming up short uh, while trying while trying uh, we're coming up to time i just want to say if you have to go please feel free uh, we'll take the last round here uh, a last round of a few questions and comments and then we'll have uh, some closing remarks uh, so i saw a few hands uh no more gosh uh, and mr izawa um I've seen lots of figures on the education, the state of education in uh, Myanmar, and I, and I know there's some, an effort to revamp and reinvent the system. One of the figures which jumped out at me was from the McKinsey report, which came out today, which stated that four, that the average schooling for the population is four years. Um, I just wondered whether you had you could offer any more insight into that. Is there a gender imbalance, regional imbalance, higher education, lower education, which is the path forward? And the second question, if I may, to Ong Zhao, um, you mentioned uh, that there were some media groups which are controlled by uh, rich cronies or relatives of the of the of military officers, and they were fanning the flames of nationalism. Now. I just wonder whether you could offer some more detail on that and what you believe is going on. Is it, is it, is it sort of this, na this outpouring of nationalism directed by the people who own it or is it more visceral and cultural and runs through these organizations? Uh, I have a question about the peace process uh, between Nepido and the S3 groups. And 
I'm talking to the, some people from the uh, ethnic groups. And in the peace process, uh, particularly the UNFC or uh, other groups, uh, they, they insist on the introduction, the introducing of the, a kind of federal, federalism uh, in the country. And uh, they are uh, considering uh, presenting the, a kind of political platform for the uh, uh, 2015 elections. But do you think that Nepido can accept, Nepido has a room to accept this kind of uh, a direct, uh, very dr drastic change of the priority in, in the future, the, uh, in soon? This is my question. Thank you. The, um, I have a comment on the research that uh, Dr. Chayan uh, Watanapudi mentioned about, and what I want to point out is in Myanmar, with Myanmar institutions, what's happening is the research is not really affordable. So, so it's not just to do research, but to say like, you know, I, I used to be a researcher of social entrepreneurship before I returned to Myanmar to run my own social enterprise. And what my fellow researchers in Myanmar are suffering from is like, I mean, in a typical university, you should have a business source premier. Now, uh, in Myanmar, just having internet is a luxury. So uh, those kinds of uh, have the affordable research and educational sources is an issue in Myanmar. And what I want to ask is, uh, is there something in the pipeline, like the um, open educational resources that can be made available for Myanmar in a, you know, in the appropriate technology relevant way? Open education, open university accepted. There was a news, maybe it's, <clears throat> also I can tell us more, about the Open Society Foundation has initiated the, the Open University. And I think last Monday has invite, have invited uh, scores of uh, lecturers from, from uh, Myanmar University to attend the uh, workshop or seminar, preparing, preparing to send them to to uh, be to attend a workshop in University of Hong Kong, for example. Uh, just a little bit uh, add to what you have said. Yes, I agree that uh, the the situation with regard to making contact with the international uh, <coughs> organization from university point of view is very difficult because of the lack of international office or or even the internet, for example. But at the same time, uh, I also would like to mention that when we talk about research, uh, now we talk about the uh, think tank, research done by think tank like MRT, or research done by the state research institute. But I think now I have seen uh, research done by um, local people. Uh, like for example, people in Tawai, uh, they have already they have already had engaged in data collection with regard to their livelihood, how they depend upon their natural resource there, particularly the uh, nut economy, which is uh, a source of the income there. So they have collected data and analyzed the income which come from the natural resource, and their dependency on that. And in also in Selvin, a uh, group of uh, Korean along the along the both sides of the border, uh, working together in collecting data with regard to the the dam to be built, the the uh, the dam in Selvin. So there are different levels of research that can be done in the context of development. Do you know of any open source uh, education coming online? Yeah, the OSF is trying to do that. Um, yeah, uh, and also the the ten American institutions, uh, they are also thinking not just on the traditional uh, scholarship programs. They are also trying to think of some uh, maybe quick impact programs, capacity building programs, and also some tech, uh, you know, appropriate technology using the internet and all that. Uh, I think they are they are trying to look all the options. So we need uh, a massive way to utilize all these offers. Okay, thank you. Now we'll come to the last uh, uh, couple of questions, uh, and I want to address this to Ong Zha about the uh, Nomo Gosh's question about the flames of nationalism being fanned 
could, could you talk about that? I mean, this is relates to your earlier comment about possibly this is organized violence, an early campaign to discredit NLD, uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi, ahead of 2015, and uh, you know who's fanning the flames. And then uh, we'll come to uh, Zhao for the last question on this uh, potential for federalism in, in Myanmar. And, and Gwen Robinson, feel free to also add if you, if you have something to add. I cannot assume. We journalists can help make an assumption. Uh, but uh, my working theory is that, uh, uh, as I said earlier, the media and uh, some government elements and army are all related. And whenever something happens, uh, these elements can feed a lot of information to th th those media who are very powerful. And, uh, and last year was a very ugly that uh, if you look at the headlines, and then they, they, they really are playing the anti-Muslim. But this year, uh, during the Mekhtila incidents, I think media inside and outside are uh, uh, I would say more careful in terms of reporting the incidents uh, of these uh, Muslim uh, anti-Muslim riots and and but also I want to make a, a, a small brief statement that I'm not I'm not accusing the government was behind. I'm saying that some elements. I kept saying that there are some elements who have a vested interest in that this. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this political process are uh, behind this, this, this uh, violence and, uh, and uh, I think there could be uh, institutional issues and also we don't know as Gozo said uh, we don't know the motive of the military we don't know and, and hardliners and also the ruling party leaders and also I cannot speak for Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, the NLD uh, which has lost a lot of credibility because of uh, because of their the issues on uh, on, on uh, Oregon and uh, and uh, the copper mine uh, violence and uh, crackdown. So I think they, they don't have a lot of credibility, which is maybe uh, also systematically some people thought that they're trying to trying to discredit her. I don't know. I cannot speak for. Her. And also there are a lot of gray areas, of course. Lastly. I think the media needs to pay more attention on the, the Argon voices, the Rakhine people. There are a lot of reports about what uh, Rohingya people are saying and their grievance and uh, their sufferance and the plight of Rohingya. But also there are a lot of issues about what the Arganese people are saying. So we, we, we we, we've been sending a lot of reporters there to, to get a story out of that area what our Afghanist people are saying, which is very important for all of us as a media practitioner to, to highlight the issue of our Afghanist people too. This is the exactly the direction that um, our constitution has also uh, paved the way. So right now, what we have, which we never had before, it's a, a kind of a, a federal-like structures where we have uh, all these 14 states and regions are uh, being de decentralized. So the, for the first time, we have the sub-national parliaments, the, the chief minister, and the, the sub-national governments to govern the, the state and region issues. And then they have the separate um, um, lawmaking power to start uh, collecting local taxes and all that. So this is... <coughs> Um, it it doesn't reach to the the goal that probably some or many uh, ethnic uh, nationality groups have desire for, but at least this give kind of a working environment where it we will have a chance to uh, perfect it. So probably I think this is where maybe I, IDRC can help us because I think Canada and a lot of many other countries have a lot of uh, the practical issues in dealing with uh, implementing the federalism. So even in the United States, it's not that easy. Um, and then the Canada is also uh, quite challenging because we are talking about not just 
a federalism based on the regions. We are talking about the federalism based on ethnicity. In many researchers know perfectly that that kind of model is so dangerous for the ethnically divided countries. So we have to be very careful about this, even though uh, we can understand, and then I think the government is recognizing uh, the sentiments. And then now on the last few months, the, the F word, the federalism has been uh, discussed a lot uh, in, in, um, in, in the vicinity of the, the peace uh, uh, center. And then also many NGOs and uh, academics are being invited to, uh, to define what they mean by federalism and try to work out all the detailed aspects of what they mean by federalism. Then maybe we can find some common ground to, um, to actually synthesize what kind of federalism can be the best fit for the country. So I think the government is very open and the, for the first time the ethnic nationality groups are able to say freely about federalism because this is a word that it can lend anyone to into jail uh, previously. Um, and then I think uh, researchers like us are also trying to help. Uh, there are many ways that we may be able to make federal processes happen. For example, like a physical decentralization uh, is something that we are working uh, with the Ministry of Finance because right now we have the, the kind of a cash transfer system where the, the, the federal, the union government will have to uh, transfer uh, resources to the state and regions and right now, it is, it's an open arena for all kinds of negotiations and persuasions. So then moving away from that political uh, determined cash transfer system into a much more uh, equitable, formula-based, uh, rule-based uh, kind of a system, it's, it's a precursor for the fully, full-fledged federal uh, kind of a governance system, so we are working on it. And then many of these uh, representatives are also trying to make uh, m many of these processes uh, in place. Uh, if I may just take uh, one question from the NEMA about the data. Again, it's a, it's a very serious data. I think it doesn't really very far-fetched from what the government has uh, also acknowledged, that we are still... Uh, so I think the recently multi-donor groups are involved in what they, we call the Comprehensive Education Sector Review, CESR. Many, many, uh, this is a nice model where many donors try to coordinate on very important issues and try to pull all the resources and try to start with this process and uh, hopefully uh, we will come up with uh, uh, many more reliable data on it. Uh, on the census, it's, another, <laughs> uh, uh, it's not a funny issue, but um, it's a very challenging, uh, you, you pick the census and population data. We have like a four or five author authorized source which are talking about 60 million and 52.5 million, 55 million, and then the one UN agency, I think, was talking about 45 million. And then we are going to determine what really is that uh, by the next year's census. Uh, but uh, anyhow, I think, uh, to my own estimation, there's a little bit of uh, overestimation of our population because we have already uh, sent a lot of migrant workers to Thailand. Uh, but uh, if the census data out, uh, I think it will be a good news for us because definitely the GDP growth will boost uh, up. So I think uh, we, we are, of course, um, we are trying to utilize something like a census to, ab to be able to get some reliable data and perhaps if any of the donors wants to help, I think that would be a good uh, entry point. I just wanted to pick up on Zoe's earlier excellent point. Um, 
talking about everything from federalism to you know ethnic, religious, racial violence. I think what in recent visits, what's really become clear, and your point about um, the decentralisation going on, and and how governors and states, are, I mean, uh, chief um, representatives and states, are being uh, encouraged to really govern. And uh, the two-child policy announcement, to me, uh, to many, I think, analysts and journalists, uh, really broadcasts that there's yet another competing power centre, uh, um, possibly, if not threatening, but challenging central government control, and that is uh, the Rakhine State authorities clearly taking um, matters into their own hands to, to revive their own ban that they actually put on earlier and didn't apply. So I think that's, uh, that's really something to watch for, that this whole rush for decentralisation is empowering the, the local um, state uh, authorities and at the same time you've got other rifts going on like uh, with the religious violence people have gone on about the um, dark forces in the Buddhist uh, monk uh, community well I think also the religious uh, are, are very split themselves so there's rifts happening all the way down the line so uh, it's really um, getting much more complicated and muddy as so we suggested uh, we're going to bring this to a close. The, the IDRC Vice President is going to provide some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, a couple of things that were highlighted today uh, in the context of our topic, development research. Uh, donor coordination, I think sharing of information uh, among the various donors, you know, all rushing into uh, stampeding. Uh, very important because it, there's a lot of overlap, uh, a lot of wasteful resources. And second, uh, the data collection uh, and reliability. I think that's where uh, research has to begin. Uh, so that's something that we all uh, need to, to keep an eye on uh, and work on. Now, I invite uh, Annette Nicholson, uh, IDRC's uh, Vice, Pre Vice President for Corporate Strategy and Regional Management. Uh, it's my honor to be here, and it's been a privilege to listen to this very distinguished uh, panel. So I'll start with Thank, thank you. Uh, and I'll start with thanking the, the audience because you are, uh, it's obvious that uh, you have great interest and engagement in these issues. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are in a position to ask uh, questions and make comments, they were uh, clearly very uh, insightful. I also want to thank the organizers and the co-hosts who uh, brought this together very, very quickly. Uh, and despite that, it ran very smoothly and attracted a very large group here. I want to thank the panelists, uh, the clear experts who provided very frank and, and useful insights that uh, we will take away with us, and the moderator who uh, kept us all together and uh, whose insightful questions really set the stage for this very rich uh, discussion. So thank you to you all. Uh, IDRC's interest uh, as a funder of uh, research for development um, it's something I, I just want to touch on briefly. My colleagues and I, we, we came here to listen and to learn. Uh, we're looking for opportunities to contribute to Myanmar's resurgence. Uh, and that contribution will be through research funded uh, here uh, in Asia and, and hopefully in particular in Myanmar. So, you know, we're looking for research partners to develop relevant research proposals uh, that IDRC can work with. So this rich discussion has been very helpful to us uh, to understand both the opportunities and the challenges. Um, we noted uh, Ang Zhao's cautious optimism. Uh, although this is clearly a very exciting time to, for us to uh, re-engage with uh, Myanmar. It is a crowded field, and uh, there is risk of uh, fatigue, as Dr. Tijinan uh, said, recipient fatigue. Uh, and as a result, IDRC needs to be very uh, strategic in its approach to avoid contributing to the confusion that uh, Gwen Robinson uh, identified and to address um, in IDRC's way some of the capacity development needs um, that uh, Dr. Chan described. Uh, we also need to help develop the, the linkages between the demand and the supply side that Zhao has uh, identified as uh, important. 
So my colleagues uh, at the back over there have been taking note, and uh, probably extensive notes, and we will be taking the results of this discussion uh, back with us to ensure that IDRC's next steps contribute to Myanmar's development in a meaningful and a constructive way. So thank you all very much.